Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, see uh, so many uh, young people learning all these subjects. Um, so, so my uh, topic is the density matrix for normalization group. Um, and uh, originally, I was scheduled to come somewhat later in the uh, uh, school, and I needed, I wanted to connect up with another um, conference that's later in the week. Uh, so I had it moved here. Um, but then I realized that uh, um, there are certain things that normally come before DMRG, things like exact diagonalization, uh, that naturally help you with DMRG. And so since I'm uh, right at the beginning, I'm going to start with some of an overview of, of a set of things that sort of lead up to DMRG. Um, and so I'm going to start out with topics that are uh, that probably nowadays should be taught at the undergraduate level, um, but um, because our quantum mechanics is getting a little bit out of date, it, it probably usually isn't. Um, and uh, so when I've, been, uh, I've, I've taught uh, senior uh, quantum mechanics for our physics majors and uh, started introducing some of these things, and, and they're fairly straightforward topics. Um, now, it turns out that... Uh, so somewhat I, what I'm going to tell you, I spend a few weeks on when I teach at the undergraduate level, and we don't have that much time. So normally I give this on the board, and you know one, one of the things about giving a lecture on the board is that it slows you down so that people have time to think about it, um, which is really important because it's all about thinking about it instead of just the words coming out of my mouth. Uh, so we, we don't really have time for that, so I'm doing something... Uh, sort of experimental, which is I tried to write uh, with my best handwriting, which isn't very good, lecture notes, and I scanned them with my iPad, and uh, so we'll see them, and so it'll go faster than it would as if I was writing them on the board. Um, you'll have them afterwards, um, but uh, it'll be intended to be a lecture, and the, the thing is that these are, they, we're starting out with fairly simple things. So hopefully you can keep up just because it's not really so new. But there's probably things that a lot of you didn't, didn't hear about as, uh, uh, in your classes. So we'll start out just talking about sets of spins, uh, mostly spin one-halves, and uh, Hamiltonians for them, uh, doing exact diagonalization for a cluster of those spins. Um, and then we'll talk about ideas related to entanglement, uh, something called the Schmidt decomposition. Uh, for that, you need a, a matrix uh, linear algebra little tool called singular value decomposition, which should be taught at the sophomore level, uh, but often isn't. And uh, uh, so I'll explain what that is. Uh, tell you about uh, the entanglement entropy and something called the area law. And um, once I'm done with all of this uh, background, then the idea of matrix product states will be a lot easier for you than when um, we first started doing this. It was uh, harder to understand, but uh, um, with uh, more recent ideas, many of them coming from the field of quantum information, a lot of the concepts have sort of gotten a little bit easier. And then I'll lead up to DMRG, that will the the later part of this will come um, in uh, in tomorrow's lectures. <clears throat> okay, and then uh, to have this all sink in, you really need to do uh, exercises, and a lot of the exercises should be um, computational. Um, I've been a C plus plus programmer uh, since the early '90s, and. Uh, done pretty well with it, but, I, you know, C++ has gotten more capable, but it's also gotten more and more complicated. And um, so uh, just recently I've been using the language Julia, which is a pretty new language, has some things in common with Python and MATLAB. And um, I find it uh, quite nice. Uh, and it's, it's a language that has a really fast startup time. So I can just start typing some lines in it, and you'll be able to see what's going on. And you'll be able to do things, simple things, really fast with high-level commands. So I'm going to uh, give exercises. I'm going to 
So Julia is free. It's faster than the other, other choices. It's got a good online documentation. It's quick to download, so you can just get started right away. And uh, so we will have uh, exercises in that. So you're, you'll be forced to learn a little bit of Julia, and hopefully you'll like it as much as I, I do and play around with it. Now, uh, <clears throat> once we get into sort of the more state-of-the-art DMRG calculations, um, there are uh, things get a little bit complicated, and you need software that's sort of specifically designed to help you do uh, matrix product states, DMRG, tensor networks. So we have a library that uh, is uh, online. Uh, it's at the website itensor.org. And um, uh, more than a dozen, I don't know how many, several dozen maybe groups are using it. And uh, so I'm going to show you how that works. This um, introduces some nice notation and sort of makes uh, some programs extremely easy to, re to write in this sort of calculation. And, and uh, it also allows you sort of state-of-the-art efficiency. So we'll do some of that uh, towards the end. Okay. So, but let me start with an overview of where the field is. Uh, and so I just want to talk not about all numerical methods used in condensed matter, but just the ones that are targeted at solving the Schrodinger equation for a set of uh, many electrons. And since spin systems normally are made up of electrons also, it will include spin systems. <clears throat> okay, so there's two general uh, types or two gen general areas that people usually are in one or the other and they don't cross between them very much. Although uh, one of the things that I'm doing now is crossing between them. Uh, but the, the two areas are, um, one is where you are trying to understand the chemical details of your material. And so you include all of the electrons and the details of the orbitals. And um, you usually use density functional theory or variations on DFT. Um, but those techniques are um, really only reliable for weak correlation. And so you look at either certain materials that are only weakly correlated, or you learn, look at certain properties of strongly correlated materials with that. The other side of the field is people who are really interested in the strong correlation. And uh, so, you know, the, the, the most famous, famous example of a strongly correlated material would be the high temperature superconductors. Um, to do those, to study those things, you need something that uh, tries to treat the Schrodinger equation more exactly. And uh, the price that normally you have to pay in order to be able to use these techniques is that you have to simplify the Hamiltonian. So you can't include all the electrons. You can't include all of the interaction terms or try to get all the interaction terms exactly right. So we write down very simple model Hamiltonians, and then we try to solve those model Hamiltonians very accurately. Um, the, the simplest sort of example of this sort of thing is the icing model for magnetic systems, which was introduced as a super oversimplified model um, way back in the early part of the 1900s. And uh, yet, uh, by solving this model uh, precisely, you got the first sort of understandings of phase transitions. Uh, nowadays, we have models like the Hubbard model, uh, various forms of the Heisenberg model and the TJ model. These are models that have strong correlation, and we're still working at trying to solve these uh, systems well enough in order to understand what goes on in strong correlation. Okay, so we have these. Uh, <clears throat> so in the model Hamiltonian methods, we consider just the active electrons or spins. See, I should mention that there are methods that are trying to combine the two things. So uh, you may have heard or you will hear about things like density functional theory plus dynamical mean field theory. And there's a number of other types to try to bridge the gap. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to focus. I think you'll, you'll have other people talking about DFT-related things. Uh, I'm going to focus on these model Hamiltonian, uh, this area, and then 
um, to study this area, then we have to pick which algorithm that we're going to use. And again, people tend to get specialized in one or a few uh, types of algorithms. Uh, one of the oldest was Quantum Monte Carlo. And Quantum Monte Carlo is, uh, is an extremely useful uh, technique. In fact, uh, one of the first Monte Carlo methods, I think, was, was mentioned in, the, in this morning, the Metropolis algorithm paper. But the putting in quantum mechanics uh, followed pretty soon afterwards. And so those are, are powerful techniques. They also have significant limitations. ED, that stands for exact diagonalization. Um, this is, gives you the exact an answer. It's just that it's limited to a, a very small system size. Um, dynamical mean field theory, uh, I won't say too much about, but you may hear uh, later. And I'll focus on DMRG. And then there's a set of related techniques, cluster, sort of cousins of, of DMRG. And the broader field that includes DMRG is called tensor networks. Um, and uh, so these, are, these are, are all sort of based on the same type of ideas. They're sort of different. You know, DMRG is one type of simple tensor network that's sort of optimized for one dimension. And uh, <clears throat> there are other ones that are more optimized for higher dimensions. And uh, so this is one of the newest types of methods, and it's uh, generated a lot of excitement. It's also generated, the tensor networks has also generated a lot of excitement even in things like quantum gravity. If you can believe that one of our condensed matter techniques is actually doing something in quantum gravity. Uh, but uh, anyway, that's a, that's a very interesting field. And, and the other thing is it's uh, connected to quantum information. And so we'll talk a little bit about some of the chapter one ideas of quantum information. Uh, and then that will actually help us understand the DMRG algorithm better. Okay, so the background that we'll cover uh, exact diagonalizations, model systems, uh, some of the quantum information and entanglement. And uh, those will be mostly the topics uh, today. Um, and then I'll uh, throw in just a little bit of uh, showing, typing you a f uh, typing a few lines in Julia just to uh, whet your appetite. And um, uh, there'll be some exercises that I sort of give out as we go along, which you can try to do as soon as you can. Um, mostly, mostly computational, but uh, we'll have one in class one where you, I'm gonna ask you to everybody to uh, write, try to solve a little simple uh, spin, Hamil write down a simple spin Hamiltonian for me. And that'll come up pretty soon. And it'll, we'll try to get everybody sort of uh, thinking on, or sitting on the same page. And so tomorrow we'll uh, go on to the more advanced topics. Okay, so let's start with exact diagonalization of small clusters of spin one halves. So the standard quantum mechanics books tend to tell you about at most two spin two spins. You add their angular momentum. Uh, you learn about the Pauli spin matrices. Uh, but do you ever get four spins in a row and say what's the ground state of that system? Normally, you don't. So we're going to we're going to uh, uh, do little diagonalizations like that, which is sort of a, a key part of condensed matter physics now. Okay, so so let me just start reviewing. We uh, we remember the Pauli matrices for spin one half. The spin operator is uh, the vector s is h bar r over two times the vector sigma, and the vector sigma is a vector where the x, y, and z components of that vector are each matrices. Okay, so the, uh, this is all written in the z basis. So we think of the natural sort of direction for the spins to point is up or down. And the, the sigma z operator is diagonal in this basis. The first, um, the, the first element in a vector is the up part, and the second one is the down part. So here's a little spinner. The up index is A, and the down index is B. And that represents the wave function where you have coefficient A times up and B times down. Okay, but then we have the other components of the spin. The sigma X has these off-diagonal ones, and the sigma Y has the off-diagonal I's. 
And uh, so the off-diagonal piece means that we have to do more work. If, the, if, if your Hamiltonian is diagonal, you're already done. You can just look at the diagonal elements and read off the eigenvalues. But we have off-diagonal elements there. OK, let me go. I'm going to try to, OK. OK, so sigma z is diagonal. So sigma z times an up gives you an up. Sigma x times an up gives you a down, so it's not diagonal. OK, so now let's go to two spin one-halves. And I'm going to imagine that I write down a Hamiltonian, which is h times s1 dot s2. So I have the spin operator for spin 1 dotted with the spin operator for spin 2. They're vectors, so I do the dot product. And then I'd like to know what are the energy levels of uh, this two-spin system. Well, there's a, there's a way to sort of shortcut the answer to this with a sort of algebraic trick, which I'll, I'll show you first. But it's not, a, not as general a trick as you'd like, so then we'll sort of do a more systematic way of doing it. But starting off with the algebraic trick, um, so s total is the vector s1 plus vector s2. And that's the defini definition of the total spin. And we should keep in mind that spin operators on different sites commute. Okay, then s total squared is the dot product of the s total operator. So we expand out s1 and s2. Um, and then do a little bit of algebra and get this expression. And the thing about this expression is it has our Hamiltonian in it. That's where this is a sort of trick. Ordinarily, you do s squared, and you don't find the Hamiltonian magically pop out. Okay? And we also know from the basic properties of angular momentum that the expectation value of s squared is given by this s angular momentum quantum number with this expression. And so if we plug into this expression for spin 1 half, uh, you get s squared equals 3 quarters. And I'm going to set h bar equal to 1 from, from now on. And for spin 0, you get s squared equals 0. And for uh, spin 1, you get s squared equals 2. So I have pieces. And just a little bit higher, I have the uh, s squared. So I have all the pieces, and so I can solve. Uh, I can plug into this equation and get uh, s times s plus 1 is this, these values and then solve it for s1 dot s2 and find it in terms of the uh, total angular momentum quantum number of the two spins. Of course, the angular momentum number for a, a single spin one half is fixed at one half. Okay, and so there, what are the possible values of the total angular momentum for two spin one halves? Well, it can be in a spin zero state or a spin one state. So for the spin zero state, you plug it in and you get minus three quarters. For the spin one state, you plug it in and you get plus one quarter. And so that's sort of a shortcut of just doing a little bit of algebra to uh, find out what uh, the energy levels of the two spins are for this Hamiltonian. And the triplet is triply degenerate. Uh, and so we have energy structure that looks like this, assuming that um, yeah, assuming that there, if there was a J in front, it was positive. <clears throat> OK. So now a more general approach that works for more, more spins is to write H as a matrix in a basis. OK, so what's our basis? Well, for two spins, you have to list every possible state for every up or down value for each spin. So for these. Uh, Kets here, the left arrow is spin 1, and the right arrow is spin 2. And I have these four possibilities, just like doing a binary arithmetic with two digits, you have four possible numbers. Okay. Then a wave function is a vector, and the, it, you just have to give the complex coefficient in front of each of these basis states, and then that gives you any possible uh, wave function. So the length of it, the vector is 4 here. But if I had n spins, it would be a vector of length 2 to the n. Uh, an operator is a matrix, and it would be 4 by 4 here. Um, if it was n spins, it would be 2 to the n by 2 to the n. So an operator, you have to write every possible 
uh, basis state twice, one, one choice gives you the row, and the other choice gives you the column, and then you have to do the matrix element sandwich for that operator between these two basis states, and that'll give you the expression for that operator. Okay, so uh, we'll, we've taken S is one half sigma, um, H bar is one. Um, it's convenient to uh, not use, for, for doing the Heisenberg model, which uh, involves the S dot S interactions, it's convenient to avoid the SX and SY pieces and write, uh, define the S plus and S minus spin raising and lowering operators just as Sx plus or minus Isy. Okay, that gives you Sz is again diagonal, but it's got one halves and minus one halves on the diagonal. And S plus <coughs> it has a one in one corner and the rest are zeros and S minus is its transpose. Okay, so we can use these uh, matrix forms to evaluate any particular uh, operation of one of these operators on a basis state. So these operators are only for one spin at a time. So we apply them to say, say we apply it S plus on the down state. Okay, we write down the matrix for S plus. We uh, write down the spinner for down. The first index is up, the second is down, so I put a one on the bottom. And then I multiply and I see that I get this one zero vector, which is the up state. And so I've evaluated what this is. Okay, so if you, and then you could put any other state on the other side of this, up or down, and use this expression and find out what matrix elements of, uh, in this case, S plus, which we already know. Okay, and S plus on up, if you do that, you find it zero. S minus on down is zero. It's trying to lower something that's already at the bottom. And S minus on up, is down. <clears throat> okay, so uh, a little bit of algebra gives us a better expression for S1 dot S2 for numerical calculations. Okay, so for numerical calculations, uh, so we'll, we'll use this Z basis and we leave the SZ, SZ part of it alone. Um, this is a nice part because the in the Z basis this is diagonal. Uh, so it only gives you diagonal elements in Hamiltonian matrices. Um, and then the SX, SX, and SY, SY gives you this S plus, S minus, plus S minus, S plus, uh, times uh, one half. Okay, and what this uh, operator does actually is it uh, flips two spins that point in opposite directions. So if you have an up down, one of these two terms will flip it the other way, and then the factor of one half will go in front of it. If it's two ups, one of the S plus or minus will, will give you zero, or if it's two downs, one of them will give you zero. Okay. The other thing to keep in mind is that if you have a system with several spins, each of these spin operators is attached to a particular site, and it only works on that particular site. And the state of any other spin is left alone. Okay, so if I take S1 plus S2 minus on this three spin state, down, up, up, I can move the S1. First of all, I, I can always expand this vector with three spins in it into a, a product of three spins together. So an up with a cat, and a, or a down with a cat, and up with a cat, and up with a cat. Okay, then I can move the S1 operator next to that spin. This goes along with the spins, uh, spin operators on different sites commuting. And I can move the two over to its spin. And then I have the third spin, it just sort of sits there at the end. Sort of goes out there, but I ran out of room. Okay, and then the S1 on the down gives you an up, the S2 on the up gives you a down, and you get this state. Okay, so you can see an exercise has appeared here. Uh, so get ready, because uh, I'm going to have you actually work on it 
um, with me not talking for about five minutes. Make sure I don't, oops, I skipped way down. Don't want to give the answer. Um, okay. So I've given you the pieces that you need to do the following exercise. Okay, so we want to write down, we, we already found the energy levels for two spin one half. So this is the same problem. Um, but we want to show for two spins. Okay, there's a typo here that I'd left off the S1.S2, it's right there. So the Hamiltonian has a J in front of it, the usual coefficient S1.S2, which is just what we've been writing. Okay, so I want the Hamiltonian matrix for this uh, two spin system. Okay, and so uh, the, this is the, the basis states for two spins. Um, up, 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 down, down, up, and down, down. And so any operator would be a matrix in this basis. And I'm telling you here that the Hamiltonian, if you use this form of S1 dot S2 up above, if you use that, um, you find that the Hamiltonian has a number of zeros sort of along the edges. Okay. And then it has only two different numbers, an A and a B, except that uh, the A is sometimes negative. Okay, so I want to let you all work for five minutes on trying to find out, yes, the Hamiltonian matrix looks like this, and second, what is the value of A and what's the value of B? Okay, and then I'll show you the answer. Okay, so five minutes, everybody try to work this out. And I'm going to move this up a little bit so you can see some of the crib sheet sorts of notes. Okay, so I think this is the key stuff. Let's see, yeah. Okay, this is the key stuff. And uh, so everybody, let's see, write down this basis. The basis has up, 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 down, down, up, and down, down. Okay, and uh, let's see, I guess I better shrink this so you can see more. There, <clears throat> okay. So, everybody think and write. I'm gonna sit down. Let me fix the typo.
uh, hold that thought. Okay, why don't why doesn't everybody compare with the person next to you? Match up with the person next to you and see if you got see if you got the same answer or see if you're stuck at the same place. Everybody talk to the talk to the people around you and see if you <clears throat> see if you know something that the other person doesn't. Okay. Okay, we'll have to move on. Um, let me. Okay, so first, first, let me show you how one way to look at this problem. If you, it's it's sort of natural to do a row at a time uh, or a column at a time. So you can do something like hit the Hamiltonian on up up and see which terms you get. And you should get some terms that look like you know pieces with the with the, all the basis states, and so that you read off the coefficients. And if this, a term is missing, then that's a zero. Okay. So for instance, if we hit up up times the Hamiltonian. Okay. Well, there's the Hamiltonian we're looking at is right here, and the first, the more complicated part is this plus minus part. But up up, one of those pluses or minuses is going to kill. Want that, and so this term gives you nothing. Okay, so all the expression for up up comes from this guy, and uh, S Z for up up is one quarter, uh, sorry, one half times one half, and so A is one half times J. Okay, so sorry, one fourth. Thank you. Okay, so go back to the big. Okay, so here's the answer. It was one, uh, A is one fourth and B is one half. Um, okay, and uh, so that's uh, a pretty simple thing, pretty, pretty simple algebra. If you're not used to it, it uh, just takes a little bit of practice uh, to sort of get, uh, get quite good at it. Um, we can diagonalize this matrix. Um, it's got, <clears throat> the first and the last ones are uh, have no off-diagonal elements, so the eigenvalues are, are already given. So we see that two eigenvalues are one quarter. The first and the last and the eigenvectors would be that up up or the down down that goes here. And then we have a little two by two matrix that you can diagonalize. Okay, and it's a two by two matrix that sort of has a symmetry so that the Eigenvectors have to be one one or one minus one with the root two in front. Okay, so you can diagonalize this uh, uh, analytically pretty quickly. Um, and uh, so, what do we find? We find that uh, the singlet state is this one over root two, one minus one with the zeros top and bottom. So the singlet state is this one over root two up down minus down up. Okay, that's the spin zero state. That's got the energy is minus three quarters, and there should be a J. Okay, the triplet 
we already have two of the pieces of the triplet. We know their energy has to be one quarter. I've, I've just left off the J here. <clears throat> uh, but here's the first two eigenvectors, and then the third has uh, the middle two guys with a plus sign on both. Okay. So let me pause a little bit and show you uh, the very simplest thing with Julia. So here I have a blank, uh, looks like a Linux screen, but uh, rem it, this is a Mac, and Macs underneath are Unix, which is just like Linux. So you get terminal windows that look like just in the tutorial. And I've got Julia installed, so I type Julia, and there it is. And now I have an interactive session. Okay. So I'm going to write down this H matrix. So I'll do H equals, okay, so, so the, one of the nice things about Julia is there's sort of, you get to start typing the key stuff right away. There's none of the headers and stuff. Okay, and there's a nice notation for matrices. Uh, okay, so I'll have to do this from memory. Um, let's see, the matrix was one quarter. So, um, right, it's one quarter, 0 0.0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay, and uh, I have spaces in between the numbers. Okay, then I'll hit the next column. Let's see, there was a 0, 0. .0. And uh, what was this one? Minus one quarter. 0, 0.0, 0, 0. Point. There was an off diagonal one. This was one half. Okay, 0 0.5, 0, 0. Okay, and another 0, 0.0, 0, 0. 0.5. And this one was minus one quarter again, right? 0 0.0, 0, 0 0.0, all these are zero. And this was one quarter again. Okay, hit enter. Okay, so it's uh, created a uh, matrix, printed it back out so I can see it's all fine. Okay, so that's how you enter a matrix. You just know the elements. And then to diagonalize it, I fact of H diagonalize it and gives you the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Okay, so the eigenvalues uh, are minus 0 0.75, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25. Of course, I've left off the J because it's not Mathematica or Maple where you can do it symbolically. You have to uh, do it numerically, uh, but it's... Uh, got a lot of built-in capabilities. So it first lists the eigenvalues, and then it lists the uh, eigenvectors as columns. And so the ground state, you can, they're lined up like this. So the, the ground state has this minus one over root two, and plus minus one over root two, et cetera, and you can see the other ones. Okay, so that's just a little uh, taste of Julia. Okay, oh, let me show you one. Let me show you one more thing. Uh, where is my, let's do Safari. Okay, let's just go up here and type julialang.org. Okay, and uh, you can go to, so you get see this where you can download it. Uh, so on the Linux workstations here, it's been downloaded uh, and, and uh, tested. You can go to docs and find all of your basic commands. And so you use this page a lot. And then you have a search here, and so I can do eigenvalue. And uh, find listings, it only gave me one. Okay, so sometimes, you know, sometimes these searches um, don't give you everything right away, but uh, there's actually several different eigenvalue routines. There's lots of built-in linear algebra. Okay, so basically you can search through this. You can, this eig fact, if you didn't remember that, you would look through here. Here's the first of the routines. Eig computes eigenvalues and eigenvectors of A. See eig fact for details on the balance keyword argument, so you can learn uh, all the commands. Okay. okay, let me now go back. And here we're, 
the two key commands that I used in Julia. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so let's now move to more than two spins. And uh, so the first thing to remember is that this Hilbert space is spanned by this set of basis vectors, which has every possible spin value on every site. And that makes it exponentially large in the number of spins. So there's two to the n different uh, possibilities for slots, that's how long the vector is. And this is the key difficulty of quantum mechanics uh, for many particle systems. It's that the problem that you're trying to solve is exponentially uh, large uh, in terms of the size of the Hilbert space with the number of degrees of freedom, say the number of spins. So the sort of direct approaches that we're talking about right now, writing down the Hamiltonian matrix, those can't go very far because the problem is exponentially hard. Okay? But it's still very useful to take it as far as we sort of reasonably can, and so we'll uh, talk about this for a little while. DMRG is a way of sort of shortcutting where you can do much larger systems, uh, one of a number of ways for shortcuts. And the shortcuts are essential, are essential for doing uh, the size of systems that we need. Okay, so here's psi with a to the n long vector. Uh, you write down the basis, h is a to the n by to the n matrix. And we just want to find usually the lowest eigenvalues of h, and, uh, but it's just too big. So treating n equals 100 to the 100 is just too large to store on any computer. Okay, but we'll see how we can do it with uh, three or four or 10 spins. Okay, so the n equals two case, we already have the Hamiltonian, just did that. Okay, and one of the things we should note is that the zeros, there's a lot of zeros, there's a lot of sparseness that's showing up already just with uh, two spins, and it gets much more and more sparse the more spins you have. So this huge Hamiltonian matrix is gonna be almost all zeros. The elements in general, uh, look like this, you put, um, so you can, if you're doing it symbolically, you put primes on the indices, say on the left, and no primes on the right, because it's, it's two set of duplicate indices to do an operator, okay? And uh, so it's useful to use the same indices, but just put primes on them, which just means, you know, the, the other side of the matrix, and each one's up or down, okay? So let's look at n equals three. Okay, so here's uh, our little system. Okay, and we're not putting in periodic boundary conditions here um, because later on we won't we won't want them. You know, it's uh, it's just a different problem with periodic boundary conditions. But DMRG doesn't like periodic boundary conditions as much. So we're just doing an open chain. Uh, so here's the Hamiltonian. It just has two of the s dot s's. So this is the Heisenberg model, and the Heisenberg model, the standard form of the Heisenberg model is you just put an S dot S for every near neighbor uh, bond. Okay, S1 dot S2 only operates on one and two. And uh, so, for instance, if we put S1 dot S2, and I look at this, uh, S3 is left alone. What that means is that S3 for this operator has to be diagonal. There has to be a Kronecker delta. So when I say proportional here, I'm saying basically this is zero if S3 is not equal to S3 prime because there wasn't any spin operator to change it. You start on the left, on the right, and you didn't change it, so it has to be the same. Okay. <clears throat> so the ZZ part um, also doesn't change the, it doesn't do any spin flips, so the ZZ part doesn't do anything. Uh, so the ZZ part just gives you a factor of plus or minus one quarter. Okay, so if the two spins are parallel, it gives you a plus one quarter. And if the anti-parallel, the one quarter times minus one quarter gives you a mi or one half times minus one half gives you a, a minus one quarter. Okay, and then the uh, S plus S minus piece just flips a spin. Okay, but it doesn't flip up, up to down, down. It gives zero on up, up, or down, down. So it takes an up, down, and it just trades the places. But it throws in a, a factor of one half. 
Okay, so it turns out that uh, rather than do all of the uh, algebra that you started on with the, the two-spin case, I can write down two simple rules to write down the Hamiltonian uh, for the n-spin case. Okay, and so here are the two rules. So it just is based on the observations that I just said about what each of the terms do. So first of all, the diagonal elements, well, the S plus, S minus didn't do anything to those, so that's out. So you just have the, the ZZ part. ZZ part gives you a plus or minus one quarter, but you have a sum of terms in the Hamiltonian for each placement of S1 dot S2. So you have to add up all of those one quarters. And they might, might cancel, because you might have two parallel, and then the next one's anti-parallel. So that one quarter would cancel, because they're all going in the diagonal slot. So the diagonal elements are j over 4, and then you just, you take that spin configuration on the, that's, you know, the same in the row and the column, and you add up the number of parallel spins that are neighbors, and you subtract the number of neighbors that are opposite to each other. Okay, and that adds up all those pieces together. And that's the simple rule for the diagonal elements. Okay, the off-diagonal elements are uh, zero if more than two spins are different. You know, if three spins are different, there's no way that you can do an S dot S and change three spins to match the other guy, right? You, you do have a lot of S dot S's, but they're all added. And so you can only change three spins, you only change two spins if, if you have a sum of two spin operators. Okay, so off diagonals are zero if more than two spins differ. If uh, two nearest neighbor spins are flipped, up, down, to down, up, then you get a plus one half, and you don't have to worry about minus signs. Otherwise, this is zero. Yes? Only two spins flipped. Yeah, so if, if no spins are flipped, it's not off diagonal. Okay, so then there's one spin. Say one spin was flipped. Well, the S dot S has two spins, so it's going to do something to two. It can't just change one. You know, other terms in the Hamiltonian, you know, like a, an SX piece could change one spin. But um, um, here, there, I don't have anything. So the only, and three spins can't be flipped. Four, you know, it, it, it's only the twos. Okay, and that tells you, you know, that's a small fraction that are, you know, each, the, the, the row basis state and the column basis state are almost identical. You just have a few differences between them that can give you off diagonal elements. Which is an important thing for doing the calculations because, you know, if something is zero, probably you don't have to store it. You can use a sparse form that skips it. Okay. <clears throat> so those are the rules. Okay, and mostly it's just sort of involves playing around with doing a few more examples and thinking a little bit about it rather than some fancy proof, and you'll see that those rules are right. And so you can take the n equals 3 case, and it's a, so first of all, how big is, if you, if, you know, how big is the matrix? That's the, the first thing we should know, which, well, it's 2 to the 3 by 2 to the 3. It's 8 by 8. Okay, and you can see there's a lot of zeros. Okay, but then you go through, okay, so let's, uh, let's do this upper left one. It's, uh, oh, and what did I do? I wrote it in qubit form. So qubits are just like spin one halves, except we call, say, one of them a zero and the other one's uh, a one. So here the zero is an up, and the one is a down. Okay, and so the upper left diagonal one, well, it's got three ups in a row. So it's got two parallel bonds. So each of those parallel bonds gives you a plus one quarter. So you get two times one quarter. Okay, let's take a, a middle guy. Here's a zero, one, zero. So that's got two anti-parallel bonds. And so this is a minus two times one quarter. Okay, and then some of the other ones are canceling because it's got a parallel and an anti-parallel. So you get some zeros along the diagonal. Okay, and then you just go through and you, you look at, uh, you know, look at somebody and say, well, what spin flips, near neighbor spin flips could happen that takes a one zero to a zero one. You know, this one zero could be a, could go to zero one zero. Okay, and that's this uh, one half. Okay, so you can quickly write this down or you can write a program to follow these rules. 
And all of a sudden, you, you have a really short program that can do a, uh, a diagonalization of a spin system that's uh, sort of, you know, it's just limited by this exponential growth of the difficulty of the problem. OK. OK, now there's some more simplification that comes in. Um, there are, <coughs> there are, um, there are whole rows that all the off-diagonal elements are zero. Um, more generally, it'll be sort of, you'll have blocks that are uh, sort of talk to each other and then off-diagonal stripes, that, uh, sort of rectangular areas that are all zero. And, there, and so uh, this comes from the conservation of total angular momentum. So this uh, spin operator just involves dot products of spins. So it doesn't pick a direction in spin space. So it, it conserves angular momentum. And what that means, in this case, um, the simple way to use that is just use the conservation in the z direction. So what that means is that the Hamiltonian can't change an up to a down all by itself. There has to be another down that went up to leave it with the same total numbers of ups, ups and downs. In other words, you can sort of group the, all the possibilities by the number of up and the number of down. And that's one group. And that doesn't talk to any other group. Because the Hamiltonian can't change the total number of ups. There aren't any pieces that do that. OK, so, uh, so if you count the number of ups and downs, you sort of know the total S sub z. Okay, and another way of putting it is that the Hamiltonian commutes with the total S sub z operator. Okay, so this makes it block diagonal. So often, we're only interested in one particular value of S sub z, usually S z equals 0. Or we happen to know that the ground state is in that particular value of S sub z total. And uh, so we can pick that and then just work with a smaller uh, set of states. We don't have to do 2 to the n. We can use a smaller set. So for the uh, three spin case, one of the blocks has two ups and one down. There's three possible arrangements for that. Uh, up, up, down, up, down, up, and down, up, up. Now, in the original, in the big matrix that I wrote down earlier, they weren't in order, so you couldn't see that this was a little block. But if you just sorted the Hamiltonian, and it's just a reordering of the basis states, Reordering of basis states is always allowed. This gives you the same problem. Um, you would find that this block was sitting there and it was not connected to anything else. So we can just use this block and diagonalize it that. And so this is a, just a part of the other block. The, the, the elements are the same. And so you can diagonalize this one and it's a shortcut. And you get this uh, ground state is this vector. And so you can just rewrite it in terms of these states. The other states are 0. OK, so how much does that help us? Well, it's a big help because as n gets big, the number of blocks is proportional to n. So you get to cut down your problem by a factor of n. But the whole problem is blowing up as 2 to the n. So instead of having a 2 to the n problem, you have 2 to the n over n. So it's a help, but it's not, uh, still doesn't make it not exp exponentially hard. OK, so uh, here's an exercise which is uh, for, do you want to get started tonight? Or um, let's see. So this is a mixture of um, writing down the matrix analytically and then using, say, Julia to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Would you have that? Which I just showed you how to do. So that's. Pretty easy. OK, so this is for, uh, an exercise for n equals 4, okay, an open chain. There's no con term connecting 1 and 4. And we use the sector with SC total equals 0. Okay, that, it turns out that there are six basis states in this sector. So this is a 6 by 6 matrix. You get to use those rules to uh, write down the non-zero elements and then diagonalize it. And uh, that's the exercise. Okay, and right after lecture, I'm going to send the, the PDF to someone to, to try to get it to you right away. 
So you'll have the sort of rules and stuff. Okay, so that's an exercise. Yes? How would one generally figure out which sector has a round set? Well, there are theorems that sometimes tell you. And the theorems, if they, if they apply, they probably tell you that it's at uh, the SZ equals zero sector. Uh, so there's some, some, you know, th there's a theorem that says in certain circumstances, the ground state is a singlet. So it's S total equals zero. It means also SZ equals zero. And uh, so that sometimes applies. Um, sometimes you have to do, uh, so if you have to repeat it for each value of S sub Z, it's still a big win. You might think, oh, that just gives me my, you know, factor of n back. But the calculations in between have been, you know, cut down exponentially. <laughs> so it's still a huge win. Okay, here's another uh, example. Uh, sorry, an exercise uh, that's uh, somewhat harder. Okay, so to really make a lot of progress, you don't want to just have to do everything by hand. You want to build analytic smarts into your program and have the computer calculate matrix elements for you. You do not want to try to solve a big problem by calculating every one half where it is and then diagonalizing only at the end. That's, you're doing too much work and the computer's only got the easy job. So you want to do a clever program that does it for different sizes and just figures it out using those rules. You want to build the rules into the program. Okay, so this hard exercise is for a chain of n spins, say up to n equals 10. So the 10 limitation is just because it would start getting slow to run. Uh, write a Julia function to calculate this H matrix and um, find the ground state energy for that system. Okay, and this, you, this can be done in a fairly short Julia program. And so we, this is one of the things that we'll be working on tomorrow. But you can think about that. Okay. Okay, let's think about the, one of the things that you should do as a, you know, in doing computations is to uh, think about the memory and calculation time on back of the envelope, sort of rough estimates of how long your, cal your calculation could be taking. So you write a cute little program that's supposed to do something, and, it's, and you hit enter, and instead of coming right back, it, it's, it takes an hour. Or maybe it just takes a really long time, and you, you don't have the patience. You kill it. Okay. Well, should it have taken an hour? Well, you should have in the back of your head how long it should take. And so you do, you do back of the envelope estimates of how long things take pretty easily. And so that's what this little slide is about. Okay, so the first thing to know is that if you have an M by M matrix, and you want to do, um, first of all, let's talk about the storage. Okay, it has M squared elements, so that's the storage. Um, so you should also have in mind what the storage is in, say, a desktop, say 10 to the 10 bytes. Uh, a double precision number to store is 8 bytes. We can round that to 10. And uh, so roughly our computer can store about 10 to the 9 double precision numbers. Okay, let me say another thing. You should always use double precision. It, it, well, 99% of the time you should use double precision because single precision floating point just makes two big errors and you'll be constant, even if it sometimes can work, sometimes it won't, you'll be constantly worried about it. So double precision is almost always necessary, just you always use it. Okay, so you can store 10 to the 9 double precision reals, or if it's a matrix, you can do 10 to the 4.5 by 10 to the 4.5, or about a 30K by 30K thing can sit inside your, your RAM. Okay, so how big is that in terms of N to the N? This will give you about N equals 15. Okay, so we're not going to do n equals 30 and have it fit in the computer if we just store it this way. <clears throat> so that's storing all the zeros, though, so, um, so that, that, that consideration won't apply. But um, we should also think about the calculation time. So for a full diagonalization of an m by m matrix, uh, the calculation time goes as m cubed. There's lots of matrix operations that go as m cubed. 
you know, just about any matrix factorization or matrix matrix multiply is n cubed. So it's easy to remember. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so we can translate this to CPU time. Uh, so uh, let's see, m cubed. So suppose we had this 10 to the 4.5 m cubed would be 10 to the 13.5. So that's how many floating point operations our calculation is going to have to do to diagonalize it. 10 to the 13.5. Um, the calculation time. Okay, we should have in your head how fast a computer is. Well, a computer might be able to do 10 to the 10. And this is, you know, there's not so, so much difference between a laptop, a desktop, or one node of a supercomputer. You can do 10 to the 10 operations per second. Okay, this uh, notation here, 10 to the, this op floating point operations per second is called a flop. And the usual way of uh, writing it is a, well, it used to be gigaflops. Now they talk about petaflop machines, massively parallel. But in the single, single computer you know, desktop, we're still sort of in the gigaflop range, 10 or 100 gigaflops. <clears throat> okay, so you've got 10 to the 10. And so you can estimate how long this takes. There's about 10 to the 3.5. And what we have here is seconds once you, you cancel the, the operations. And, and so that's about an hour. Okay, so this is okay. So uh, we have got crunched by memory in this particular example before we got crunched by, uh, by computer time because you can wait an hour. You can wait overnight and sleep. Uh, so, so, but this is, but it, it wasn't such a, such a dramatic difference. And so um, you could easily have something that, that really got dominated by the computer time. Okay, so, so how can we do better given these limitations? That's not a very big uh, system. Remember, it was 15 spins that we could do. Okay, so first of all, we can take advantage of the sparseness. Okay, so each row has only of order n non-zero elements. And uh, the, the number of non-zero elements is usually around n, so it's around 20 or 2n, something like that. Uh, so the storage, if you only store the non-zero pieces, you have to look at how big a, 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 a row is, which is the same as a vector. And so you get something like n times the size of a vector, or two, n times 2 to the n. Or if n is about the 20 or so, it's, say, 2 to the n plus 4. Okay, so if you do this, if you look at this, you can store on your computer up to about n equals 25 or so. So a big improvement for using the sparseness. Okay, so the, the full diagonalization, even if you, your matrix sparse, produces matrices that are not sparse. So you can't use that full diagonalization. Okay, uh, so we're, we're, we ordinarily just want, say, the ground state or a few low-lying states. Okay, so the simplest method for getting those without it doing any 
full diagonalization is the power method. This is not a very efficient, so you, you wouldn't use it, but it's easy to understand. So if you, if you look at this H tilde, which is the diagonal one matrix, the identity matrix minus epsilon times H, where epsilon is, is a small enough number. Um, this, because you're just adding a constant and a shift to the matrix, it has the same eigenvectors, and it just transforms all the eigenvalues to one minus epsilon times the eigenvalue. So it's the same problem. But um, what this matrix has is the biggest magnitude eigenvalue will be the one you want. So if you keep multiplying by this, it's going to make the biggest, the, the ground state keep getting bigger and bigger relative to everything else. It'll have, it'll multiply each eigenvector by some different coefficient in, you'll just be using a single vector, but it'll take all the components and change them and gradually project out <coughs> the uh, ground state. And uh, actually the power method is, uh, is it's not used for diagonalization because the Langshaus method is better, which I'll tell you about in a second. But um, this, but you can't use Langshaus ordinarily in uh, quantum Monte Carlo, and so sometimes you do with quantum Monte Carlo you do use this power method. Okay, so you just take this H tilde, raise it to a very high power. You start with any state that's not orthogonal to the ground state, and this will project out the ground state if k is large enough, and if epsilon is small enough, so that the ground state is really the dominant vector. Okay, and so if you do that, well, your calculation time will be, you know, will have this extra factor of k. You don't actually raise k to a power, you just keep hitting it times one vector. So the storage is one sparse matrix and one vector, or two vectors. Okay, and so this will uh, allow you to do a, a big problem and not be memory limited. Okay, now the, the, the problem with this is that the, quite a large k might be needed. So the Langshaus method, is the, the standard way of doing exact diagonalization. Um, and the Langshaus method is a way of cutting down the K with having a more clever um, method, but also an iterative method multiplied by H. It's a more clever method. Okay, so the Langshaus method, so we're still gonna start with an initial C vector that's supposed to be not perpendicular to the ground state. We'll just write it as a vector. Then the Krylov space is this space. Um, it's C and then H times C, H squared, et cetera. And this is a vector space spanned by all of these guys. Um, more importantly, you can also have a truncated Krylov space that only goes up to a certain power. Okay, and the, the whole space is all the linear combinations of this. And notice that, so here's this thing that comes in in the power method. And it's really just involving powers of H and the identity, so it just gives you different powers of H all mixed together. So it's really just doing something sort of overly simple, but within the Krylov space. Okay, so the Krylov space has to do, if you say, give me the minimum energy in the Krylov space up to some certain size, it has to do better, or at least as good as the power method. In fact, it does much better. Okay, so Langshaus is an efficient way of using this space and it finds the lowest energy vector in that space. And so what it gives you is that uh, you only have to say use k up to around 100 or 200 and it'll give you a very pre precise ground state. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, so here's the Langshaus basis. <clears throat> okay, now the trouble with hitting a vector times h is the new vector isn't orthogonal to the old vector. So it's not really very good as a proper basis state. We like to use our orthogonal states to write our matrices in. Okay, so the, but you just start with the first state and you, you make a sequence of vectors x that are gonna form your basis. And so the second state starts by hitting h times x, but then we orthogonalize it to the first state. So we subtract off this piece of the first state and it's easy to calculate what the alpha coefficient is here that you subtract off and it makes it orthogonal so that x is, x2 is orthogonal to x1. <clears throat> and then you throw in a normalization factor. You know, and the, the, it's easy to look up exactly what these, these factors are in terms of dot products and things. Okay, then we can go along and make x3. 
Okay, now you hit, you hit H2, you hit X2 by H again, and it's not orthogonal to X2, and it's not orthogonal to X1. So you have to orthogonalize it to both. So you subtract off a of beta X1 and choose these coefficients. And you might think that this is pretty cumbersome because you have to keep orthogonalizing it to everything. But it turns out that once you go past this level, an alpha and a beta that subtracted off, you get to drop all the others. It's automatically orthogonal to all the guys in the past by sort of a mathematical sort of identity. Okay, so, so you, you might think you have to do this and get a gamma x1, which is sort of three back, but you can throw away gamma, it's gonna be zero. Okay, and so the fact that you get two of them turns out to mean that you, you know, this orthonormal basis turns out to give you a tri-diagonal Hamiltonian matrix. And so it's sort of, and this Hamiltonian matrix, now we're talking about something that only goes up to the dimension K. So it's a small number. K is this number of sort of how big the Krylov space is. So that's gonna be like 100 at most. <clears throat> and uh, so you have this tri-diagonal matrix that's only 100 by 100. It's really easy to diagonalize in that. And, and it sort of gives you this shortcut for this sort of best way of doing in the whole Krylov space. Okay, so that's the Langshaus method. And this is the standard for doing the biggest exact diagonalizations around. So the biggest exact diagonalizations use this angular momentum symmetry that we saw. They use Langshaus, and they put in every other symmetry that they can also. Okay, the other symmetries get a little bit more complicated. And then they also do it on parallel machines. And uh, so Andreas Leukli is gonna be one of the later lecturers, and he is the, the guru of doing diagonalizations of say up to uh, 50 spins, which you wouldn't think was at all possible. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so with this, uh, you look at the calculation time, uh, put in uh, M, if, if M is the size of the matrix, this to the, uh, the to the N divided by N, then if you have a sparseness factor and you have a number of steps that you have to do that sort of multiply together, and you find that uh, doing matrices up to about a billion by a billion is okay if you take advantage of all this. Okay. Okay, now uh, Julia has a Langshaus method built in. It's not called Langshaus. You have to search for it. If you look up, here's an exercise. Look up the Julia Langshaus method and then if you did this uh, general purpose, the hard problem of doing the general purpose H matrix, okay, then you can speed up your program a lot for a big system by calling the Langshaus eigenvalue routine instead of the regular one and just tell it to give you one ground state or a few low-lying states and it'll be much faster. Okay, so, uh, so then the, the challenge is how big a system uh, can you do with this in sort of like, you know, half a page program that does an exact diagonalization and can you compete with the, the fancy programs out there? Okay. Okay, we'll have time to get started a bit on some of the ideas that are the basis for a lot of quantum information. So we're gonna start talking about entanglement and uh, uh, the first thing to think about in terms of entanglement is what's, what's an unentangled state, what's, which is, is a product state. Okay, so the product, a product state is the simplest type of state where the terms just involve one thing happening on each site and multiply it together. So here's, here's some examples of product states up and down. You know that one site, first site one is definitely up. You know that site two is definitely down. Um, and there, here's two different ways, of, you know, we can always expand it in this notation. Another notation that once you're doing quantum information, they tend to use this uh, 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 direct product or chronic or product sort of form for outer, outer product. Okay, here's another product state. Okay, it's more complicated. It's not just, it's not just a product in the Z basis. So over here, I do something complicated, but it only involves uh, spin one. And then I multiply it by something complicated for spin two. 
That's still a product state. So in general, if you can write psi as a product of something going on for one, something going for on for two, et cetera, then it's a product state. Okay, so then what's entanglement? So if you have a wave function and it's not a product state, then we say it's entangled. Okay, so anything more going on is considered entanglement. Now, usually we're going to, what I was talking about was sort of product states over all the spins, <clears throat> but we usually special, uh, specialize <clears throat> to only consider entanglement across a boundary. So let's say we had a system of lots of spins, and we divided those spins as either the left part or the right part with some dividing line. It could be an arbitrary arrangement. You know, the, the math won't care. <clears throat> but we divide it into a left part and a right part. Okay, then, then we would say, then a product state is a state where we can do anything we want on the left, but we have to have a simple multiplication of, of another complicated thing on the right. There's no sums of different things happening on left and right. You know, a general wave function has lots of things going on on the left and right, all mixed together. It's what makes a quantum mechanics weird because, you know, you, you don't know what exactly is happening on the left until you know what's happening on the right. Okay, so, but let's uh, consider <clears throat> an operator O, which acts only on the left. Then if we uh, take the expectation value of this wave function, this product state wave function, on this operator that lives only on the left, and uh, commute all the spin operators, and we'll, we'll get the right part just contracts with itself. So it gives us a one. The left part has the operator part, and so we get rid of the right part, and we have something that only involves the left part. So it's an operator on the left that only involves the left state, phi L. Okay? So this is a, another way of saying that the two sides are independent. It, by an, hitting it with an operator, it's sort of like I'm looking at it with that operator. It, operator, and so I can look at the left side with that operator and, and forget about the right side. Okay, and so that's a product state. It's independent systems. Okay, so uh, entangled states. How do you tell if a system is entangled? And, uh, okay, let me hide the bottom part a little bit. Okay, so let's uh, do an example where we have our two spins again. And I'm going to give you two different states. They're both in the Z basis again. Um, and I have state A is this 1 over root 2 up up and a 1 over root 2 down down. down. Okay, and I have state B, which is this uh, more complicated piece that has all of the four possibilities for the spins with uh, the same coefficient in front of all of them. Okay, so the question now is, okay, which of these is entangled? One of them's entangled and one of them's not. And how can you tell? Okay, so, so if you think, well, entanglement is lots of terms and funny quantum stuff going on, you'd pick the second one. Say, that's, that's got every term there is. It must be entangled. Okay, but is, that's not true because the question is, is there some other way of writing it and it may just be in an X basis instead of a Z basis where it's not entangled. Okay, so in fact, B can be written as this state times that state. And it all has to do with exactly what the coefficients are. And in fact, this is just up in the X direction and the other one's up in the, in the, the, the other one's also up in the X direction. And so it's just like you, you rotate your axes and it turns out it really is unentangled. So entanglement is not something that depends on your axes. But when we look at this, we see it looks like we can't tell because it's, it looks like it depends on the axes. <clears throat> okay, so B is uh, a product state and the other one, A, is entangled. Okay, so here's an analytic exercise. Yes. One, that's, that one particle can't entangle with itself. That's not a, that's not a something. Right. 
right? Well, if a if a if a if a, a, a one unit is actually composed into more things, then you can talk about the entanglement between the parts. But you always have to have two parts at least to have entanglement. So you know, if the spin really was an atom with a spin, then the different parts of the atom are entangled. You know, so if you if you if you go in deeper that way, it's entangled. And this is actually the way it works a lot of times. It's like, okay, yeah, but we don't, it's like, is a baseball a particle? Well, did you cut it open or did you just throw it? You know, it's like a particle is, it's like, you don't get to look inside. So entanglement's the same way. If you, do, if you don't look inside, you know, there has to be two things to get the entanglement. Okay, so here's an easy analytic exercise um, to prove that this state A is entangled, which means you show that there is no alpha, beta, gamma, delta where you can write it in this product form. Because this is the most general product form for two spins. An arbitrary state here and an arbitrary state there. And so this is just quick algebra to show that this expression cannot equal that. Okay. Okay. But that's just two spins, and, and it's sort of like we're having to work hard for two spins to find out if it's entangled. Uh, how do you do this in general? You know, it's crucial to know how entangled things are. Okay, so it turns out you need a singular value decomposition. Okay, so how many people had singular value decompositions in their previous classwork sometime? Yeah, it looks like, uh, I guess, about a third. Um, if you were all engineers, you'd probably all get it. You know, what they're doing, it's like they realize how important it is. So, of course, we, you get, everybody has gotten diagonalization, right? Singular value decomposition is almost as useful as diagonalization for, for lots of different things. And uh, so, um, so uh, this will probably be about the last thing that we cover today. And uh, um, we will, uh, we will start, uh, we'll start in the computer room at 8.30 tomorrow, and then we'll uh, um, have more analytic stuff later on in the, uh, in the other lectures. Okay, so a singular value de decomposition is something that you can do to any matrix, and it doesn't even have to be square. Um, it can be complex. No, no properties really needed. It always works. Um, we, it, we, you do it with an assumption that if it's rectangular, it's rectangular sort of with, with one size bigger than the other. So it's, it's like, it can be like this. And if, it, if, it's, if it's shaped the other way, you just do the singular value decomposition on the transpose. And so it's just a slightly different way of writing it. Okay, so it's a factorization, and it says there exists a U an m by n u, um, so I'm choosing the dimensions n by m, and there's a u with this size, a d of that size, d is diagonal, and all the, all the elements along the diagonal are, are non-negative, real, so they're positive or zero, and then there's a v, <coughs> that's m by n, and m is written as this product of u times d times v. Um, usually this is written with a V transpose, and I think they do that, the math books do that just to make it look like a diagonalization. I just have stopped doing that because it's not into that diagonalization, but uh, I'm doing, being sort of non-standard here. <clears throat> so the sizes of the matrix, these, I write like this. There's a parentheses over here that got cut off. Um, but, uh, you know, it's sort of rectangular, and there's two small ones and a bigger one. Okay, then the U and V have, have properties. The U, the smaller one, is unitary. And the V is row unitary. You know, a unitary matrix has to be square. So this rectangular one over here can't be unitary. But its rows can all be orthonormal. Okay. So V dagger, V times V dagger is one. Okay. Okay, so that's the SVD. It, there's a theorem, it's, it's, a, it's a sophomore linear algebra theorem that says the SVD always exists, and, um, and that's what it is. The diagonal elements that you find from this, oh, and, and it's, a, it's another M cubed operation, 
to do it on the computer, just like the diagonalization. <clears throat> Let's see, the DII, the, these diagonal elements here, are the singular values. And they're unique. The, the whole singular value decomposition is, is clearly not quite unique because you can multiply one row by a minus sign in the V, and as long as you put the minus sign in the right column of U, it'll cancel, or you can put a phase. So there's some minus signs and phases that are arbitrary, just like eigenvectors, but otherwise it's unique. The singular values are unique. <clears throat> Um, let's see, if you want to do it so that both u and v are unitary, you can use, you can put in some extra zeros, which is what we're going to be using later. Okay, so this d tilde puts in an extra sort of block of zeros here, so the diagonal piece is over there, and then there's zeros here. And then you can enlarge v, and the, the extra rows that you put into v or v tilde don't matter because they get multiplied by zero. But um, this V tilde can then be unitary. So in this form, with this funny D, um, both U and V are, are just the ordinary unitary kind of guys. And um, if, uh, if M is real, then U and V can be taken as real. That's the usual case. OK, so um, SVDs have lots of different u uses. Uh, you know, you, you, it's like when you'd like to diagonalize it, and maybe you're, you're, you don't have the same number of unknowns as you have equations, but you still want to get a solution that's best, the best you can do in a least square sense, you can do it just with the SVD. It gives you a sort of best answer right away. There's all sorts of uses for the SVD. One of them is compression, right? So we, we talked to... You know, the, a key to doing exact diagonalization is using a compressed um, uh, a Hamiltonian matrix, not writing down the zeros. So sparseness and using a sparse matrix form is sort of a form of compression. It just says don't write down the zeros. You know, it's like, it's like gzip or any of these other compression things. It makes it a lot smaller. Okay, so here's another type of compression, a completely different type of compression that has nothing to do with zeros in the matrix. Suppose you, you thought, oh, there's, I don't, this matrix, it might have special properties. Let me do an SVD on it. Okay, suppose you found that these, a bunch of the singular values were either zero or just negligible. Okay, then you put it in this SVD form, and the, this, is a, this scribble here is a, a bunch of rows. And here's a, another scribble for a bunch of columns here. Those are the only ones that matter because the other guys get multiplied by zero. Okay, so you get to throw away most of your matrices and just keep the, the, the rows and columns that have the non-zero singular values. Okay, and uh, so this is a nice form of compression. Um, by the way, one of the places that you can read about things like this, and all sorts of other numerical things is, is the, there's a set of books called Numerical Recipes, which were written by top-notch computational physicists. And um, they're either numerical recipes in C or in Fortran or, um, and they give little programs that do standard things. But the nice thing about, about numerical recipes is it tells you the background of whatever calculation you're doing in the nicest little five-page summary you ever saw. So you want to really find out what the SVD does and what it's good for, you read that chapter in the numerical recipes. You don't have to use their program because you'd rather just use a black box anyway. But you read this and it tells you exactly what the key properties are. Okay. I took e &M way back when from one of the authors of uh, numerical recipes. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Okay, so this is a compression. This turns out to be um, one of the key ideas of DMRG. This compression is used in DMRG. Okay. And so that's, uh, we got almost through what I wanted to cover today. We'll have to make up a little bit for it uh, later. But uh, the, the next thing we'll do tomorrow in the next uh, lecture part will be the Schmidt decomposition, which directly uses this SVD. Okay, thank you.